so people should be aware that this meeting is being recorded. Um, so welcome to the annual lecture for the Leonardo da Vinci Society for 2020. Um, we are very privileged to have as our speaker tonight, the president of the society, Dr. J.B. Field, who is going to tell us about the context for Leonardo. Um, so over to you, Judith. Okay, well, the reason this is on Zoom is now on the is now on the screen. It looks like a, <laughs> looks like a Dalek that's been through the hands of a competent geometer, presumably God. Um, anyway, if we can have the next slide, um, this is COVID was our plague. This is their plague because what I'm going to talk about, of course, is in a context context for Leonardo, is um, the Renaissance. Not all of it but sort of a strand that I see as a strand, but don't necessarily put it on your exam papers. So I, I call the lecture a context for Leonardo. And the first and most obvious context is that while Leonardo was an apprentice in Verrocchio's studio, uh, this was a, build, a working site, uh, a working an active building site. Um, as you can see, I've taken the picture of the Dome of Florence Cathedral from the standard position on the corner of the Via dei Calzai um, And over on the left is the um, is Giotto's Tower, the Bell Tower. And just out of sight, over on the further, further left, is the Baptistry, which was the subject of Brunelleschi's first, um, first perspective picture. Now we call this Brunelleschi's dome, but let's think for a minute. Brunelleschi designed the method of building it. He didn't actually build it with his own hands, but he did manage to communicate with his workmen, allegedly by chopping up, um, uh, chopping up turnips to make the appropriate shape. And so he got the workmen to build it for him. Now this brings me to an interesting to a reason for being interested in the history of art, which may not be apparent to people who haven't tried studying the history of science. That is the invisible technician, the person who actually did the work is, not, is often not visible. And sometimes there are problems which can be only be explained in view of people, in view of the relationship with these invisible technicians. The one that springs to mind is Charles Babbage's inability to build his um, sort of computer, the analytical engine. And the reason he couldn't get it to go seems to have been that there was bad communication between him and his workshop, and they didn't really understand what he was asking them to build, unlike Brunelleschi, who managed to communicate with his technicians. Now, of course, we don't have the technician side of it in the case of, in the case of Charles Babbage. Uh, we have Babbage at length, but we don't know what the workman thought any more indeed than we know what the workman thought in Brunelleschi's case. But when we are dealing with things which we would now call works of art, works indeed of craftsmanship in their own day, we do usually have a rather better idea of who made the things and we are looking at the actual technicians in a way that on the whole you don't in the history of science. So that is rather useful to a historian, seems rather useful to a historian of science. Now, Brunelleschi's final words were meant to have been, don't forget the lantern. You can see the lantern on the top, they didn't forget it. That's because the weight of the lantern is required to keep those ribs in position and therefore keep the whole thing up. Now, he would have needed to know what weight of lantern and the way he would have done that is most probably to have made a model of it out of terracotta, weighed the result and then multiplied up to see what it would weigh in stone. That is a very practical kind of problem. But anyway, they built the lantern that was built by the time Leonardo would have, um, was working for Verrocchio in Verrocchio's studio. The bit that was not that was in the process of construction definitely is the golden ball on the top, because that looks like just a ball in the photograph. 
but it's actually a very large piece of bronze. And so they got a professional sculptor in to deal with the casting process. And that was Verrocchio. And Leonardo must have taken an interest in it. Indeed, there's a suggestion that he knew that the whole thing was held, was, was soldered together with the use of a burning mirror. Now, obviously, Brunelleschi is the person who gets the credit for the dome, it's well, it's well known, but the person actually in charge of the building works for a long time was, um, was not, not Brunelleschi, but um, another person, not also not known for building, for building things before that, namely, namely Lorenzo Ghiberti, who is known as a sculptor. And Ghiberti was, from, was, was trained as a goldsmith, we believe. Brunelleschi probably was as well. You learned quite a lot of mathematics while doing that, which came in handy if you had to multiply things up to find out what the bronze would, cost, would, would weigh if the, the wax weighed such, model weighed such and such. Also, another thing about taking responsibility or getting your name on things, the campanile that you can see on the left um, is always called Giotto's Tower because Giotto was in charge of the building at the time the tower was built. There's no proof at all that he designed it, though it, it's, it's a very nice, nice looking thing, so maybe he did, who knows. Um, the baptistry uh, round the corner is, is really old. Um, that goes back to that goes back to medieval times, though it was believed at the time to be ancient because it was octagonal. They thought it was a, a temple of Mars. Anyway, if we move down the dome, you notice these round windows, and they also turn out to be quite interesting. Um, they are huge. You don't get a sense of the scale from the photograph, I'm afraid. Um, the windows are 3.8 meters across. That's 380 centimeters. That's very big. And this is one that was designed by Andrea del Castagno and dates from the 1450s. Um, it was, I think it was 1450s. Have I got the, have I got the right, the right date on it? Um, anyway, that the window. The windows were commissioned from painters mainly. Uh, yes, no, sorry, it says 1445, that one. Um, you can see it's been designed like a painting, but you'd be seeing that from the nave of the church or from just below the dome. And you really wouldn't be able to see those figures. They are far too small. It's been done to the glory of God. That's a perfectly legitimate line to take, but it's not the line that was taken by Donatello. Now, why they asked a sculptor to do a stained glass window, I have no idea. Perhaps because he was there, perhaps he volunteered and said, I've never done a stained glass window before. Anyway, this is the only one of the windows, and there are eight of them, of course, um, which shows an appreciation of the fact that this is going to be seen from a great distance and that therefore you need to make the figures big. And as you can see, he has made the figures. Oh, sorry, can we have the next slide? I have I failed to ask for the next two slides. That was the castaño I was talking about. With the fig where the figures are rather small. And the next one is the Donatello. Is that all right now? I'm sorry. I'm I'm I've got the slides myself and I didn't notice. As you can see, he's made the figures huge. This is the coronation of the Virgin because the, the church is, is, is dedicated to the Virgin. And you can see that the angels, the heavenly host who are an obligatory element in the story have been just become a decorative border around the outside. All you can see is, is just a sort of little pattern, which if you look closely turns out to be angels but he's made the figures huge. Now, Donatello was aware of the problem, certainly, because he was also dealing with sculpture to be put on Giotto's tower, 
over on the left in the in the in the previous slide, um, which were going to be seen from a great distance. And just as he adapted his sculptural style to deal with the fact that those sculptures were going to be seen from a long way away, so he adapted the pictorial style to deal with the same problem. Now, this is a simple matter of optics, and you might think, well, anyone would do it. And indeed, a lot of people do. Uh, Giotto, for instance, in painting the Arena Chapel in Padua, puts rather simpler scenes with larger figures high up on the walls, and whereas the more complicated ones with lots of figures in them are in the lower part of lower part where you can look at them more closely. And of course, the great mistake was made by Michelangelo, who, who made the figures too small in the Sistine Chapel ceiling and found out when he had a look at them from the ground, from the ground once the scaffolding had been taken down, he had a look, realized the figures were too small and slowly increased the size of the figures in the second half of the, of the, of the, uh, of the ceiling. It's not immediately obvious to the casual visitor because Michelangelo was quite discreet about it, but the famous paintings, the very simple ones like the birth of Adam, the, the creation of Adam are, um, are from the later part where he'd had the, uh, he'd realized that you had to make the figures bigger. And various other people also make allowances for the fact you're going to be seeing them from a distance. Um, but this is a very, the Donatello is a very simple, a very simple example of this. Now, if we go back to the dome, there was also a completely direct, no, oh, yes, sorry. Um, that was forward one to the dome. Um, there's a very simple example of optics applied to this dome. You can't actually see the window in question because it's the one facing the south transept, which will be on your, on your right in the picture. But sometime Paolo del Pozzo Toscanelli, who was a well-known astronomer, mathematician of the time, he died in 1482, so it's got to be before then, he was allowed to make a hole in the sill of the window um, that faces due south to admit an image of the sun so that the whole building could be used as a camera obscura um, to find the height of the sun. Now, next slide, please. You can see a cross section of this thing. It fell into disuse, but was revived in the middle of the 18th century by someone called Leonardo Jimenez, at least I think that's how you pronounce it. It's got an X at the beginning of it. Um, and that you can see in the left-hand picture, which shows the cross section, you can see if you look carefully, a diagonal line running from top left to bottom right. You can see it better at the bottom where it's dark. The image of the sun is falling in the north transept. And as you can see, there's not very much of the north transept to play with. So this um, gnomon, as it's called, was only usable round about the summer solstice when the angle was very steep. Uh, otherwise, if you wanted the height of the sun any other time of year, you'd have to make other arrangements. Now, the height of this gnomon up to the lantern is 90 meters. So the height to that Donatello window was about 50 meters. You see what I mean by the, by the windows being very high up indeed. The reason why they were worried about the height of the sun at noon around the solstice was that they had problems with the calendar. They needed to know the date of the equinox in order to be able to calculate Easter. Don't let's go into details, just have to take my word for that. They knew the path of the sun in the sense that it appeared to describe it describes a circle in the sky, but it didn't do it, it doesn't do it at constant speed. And what you need to know is the, is the speed of the sun as it moves along the center line of the zodiac, the ecliptic. The reason they were interested in this, as I say, was to do with calendar reform. And you may think, well, how on earth could they lose track of the motion of the sun if they're interested in the calendar? And it's not actually as easy as it seems. You can see the sun all right, but if you want to know the position of the sun among the stars, 
you need to be able to see the stars. And of course, once the sun is up, you can't. So the usual subterfuge was to have a look at the moon instead, because if you know anything about astronomy, and of course these people did, um, you know that at full moon, the moon is exactly opposite the sun. And the moon, though bright, and therefore easy to observe, is not as bright as the sun, so you can see stars at the same time, and that means you can measure the position of the full moon and then subtract 180 degrees or add 180 degrees and you get the position of the sun. So it's worth taking these very accurate positions for the height of the sun uh, in order to be able to measure, measure the position of the sun in the zodiac in the longer run. Now, in the, the Medici were keen on being involved in, ca in calendar reform. Next slide, please because they claimed descent from Julius Caesar, who had been responsible for the last calendar reform, so they thought they ought to have their name on the next. Now, so in the, in the 1570s, that's a good hundred years after Toscanelli, um, some holes were made in the facade of the Church of Santa Maria Novella. You can see here um, a sketch made by my friend Tom Settle, um, the church facade faces south because they decided to make the church larger and they turned the transepts, which point east west, into sorry, the what is now the transepts were then the church. So they built a huge a nave at right angles to the transepts. And the result is that this facade faces south. And Ignazio Dante put up some an astronomer of the time, put up some instruments on the facade. <laughs> he also made a couple of holes, one in the, the lower one in the occhio, the, the, the round window, and another one about straight above that. And the heights of the things are 21 and 26 meters, I think. I've got the numbers here somewhere. Um, yes, 21 and 26 meters off the, off the ground. Um, now you may, art historians, you may recognize, you may recognize the surname Dante. Ignazio Dante is the younger brother of uh, the sculptor Vincenzo Dante. So, and he too, he, he's a professional mathematician. The calendar reform didn't go uh, as the Medici wished. It turned out the Pope was first in the race. And as I'm sure you know, the new calendar is called the Gregorian calendar after the Pope. It came round, it, the calendar reform was carried out in 1582. It turned out to be awfully simple, but I'm not going to explain the details of why it turned out to be so dead easy. All you had to do was knock 10 days off it and stop putting in so many leap years. Can we have the next slide, please? And the next slide shows what it's like to observe using the lower gnomon, that's the one with the hole in the rose window. That is my handwriting. I hope you can read that the width of the solar image is 38.5 centimeters and it's sorry uh, and it's um, its depth is is 28.5 it moved extremely fast it's almost got out of the photograph this was before the days of digital cameras if you want the size as, as an estimate there's a piece of chalk lying there on the ground to show you how it looked to me um, anyway we got a very nice accurate accurate picture of the, um, we got a very nice accurate ac accurate value for the, for the latitude of Florence out of, out of that one, I gather. Um, uh, may I have the next slide, please? Sorry, I'm, um, Now, the, the work on that was done by, as I said, by Ignazio Dante, and he claims that what he's doing, he claims that what he's doing is Euclidean optics. And this is not strictly true, though it would have been regarded as true at the time, because a lot of the optics he is using, which is taken basically from a book by someone called Vitello, who was indeed a, a Westerner? He, I think, he comes from Poland. Uh, he, he worked working in the working in the twelve twenties. But a lot of the work in his book 
is in fact Arabic in origin. And here is a picture of some pages of the book that it's partly come from. Um, this book is by the is the only one of the of um, the of the Arabic the Arabic writer concerned. It's the only one by him that was known in the West. Um, his name in Arabic is Ibn al Haytham, uh, but he's known in the West as Al Hassan because his initial his first names are Hassan al Hassan Ibn uh, Hassan Ibn al Hassan Ibn al Haytham. So he's got two Hassans in it, but he's known in Arabic usually as Ibn al Haytham because Hassan presumably was a fairly common Christian Christian name, fairly common, fairly common name. Now. You can see on the right hand page um, diagram which shows you, uh, I think, the human nose with a couple of human eyes on either side of it. But you notice the pictorial conventions are very far from those prevalent in the West. Um, in particular, they have this habit of drawing lots of circles which appear to intersect, which are actually meant to represent um, spheres inside each other which is a, a rather sort of rather different, different kind of thing altogether. Um, now, that is the great contribution of Ibn al Haytham to the development of optics, if you take the large view, is that he was one of the first people to make out a serious case for, indeed he said he proved, that, eyes, that the way the eye sees is by light rays coming into the eye and not by the eye sending out um, uh, eye beams, I suppose you could call them. Now it's quite probable that the reason he did, th the way he did this was by ray tracing. Because if you think about those gnomons with the rays of the sun and whatnot, it is like ray tracing. And that is the kind of optics that is characteristic of Al Hassan's work. And it is also the kind of stuff that was taken over silently into the Western tradition and generally ascribed to Euclid, though it does not come from Euclid. It comes from, as I say, from, from Ibn al Haytham. And ray tracing is very important also because it's you can you if you think for a moment it's not only applies to gnomons it also applies to such things as perspective construction and it depends on getting changing aristotle's idea of what was meant by place the idea that you could define the position of something the place of something in terms of its position so you could say the object is at such and such. It is quite a complicated philosophical argument and I don't wish to go into it. May I have the next slide, please? But it is now for the first time available in a Western language. It never got into Latin, but Aristotle on uh, his uh, Ibn al Haytham's book on place has been translated. Here is the, here is the picture, uh, the, a reference as it were for you. Now, what Ibn al Haytham does is to demolish Aristotle very carefully and slowly, and to, after that, to replace it by something geometrical, because Aristotle is not in the least bit geometrical, and Ibn al Haytham requires a geometrical definition of place in order to be able to proceed uh, with, his, with his construction of ray tracing. That is no mean undertaking. And Ibn al Haytham comes over, if you read more of him, as you can if you get hold of some of these volumes, um, he comes over as being a good mathematician. Now, I wrote a PhD thesis on Johannes Kepler, so my standard of good mathematician is Johannes Kepler, and he was pretty, pretty hard going. Um, Ibn al Haytham is clever at maths, like Kepler and like Newton. Um, and it is a pity that he has got left out of the Western tradition, but his books never joined it. His dates, by the way, he died in 1040. So his, this is way, way before the West would probably have understood any of this. They hadn't really discovered Aristotle. And that is another thing that is interesting about Arabic work, 
and why its omission from a general history of science, for which I think the Renaissance attitudes are partly responsible, I think its omission is not only an injustice, of course, to the, to the alien work, but also tends to obscure our, our view of an alternative kind of Renaissance, because the Arabic writers are also inheritors of a Greek tradition. Ibn al-Haytham has been reading Aristotle and has been reading Euclid and has been reading Archimedes and Apollonius, all the people who appear in Western Europe, either in the Middle Ages or in the Renaissance, all these people were known to the Arabic, to the Arabic writers and the use they made of them was sometimes very different from that that is from what happens in the West. And so by leaving that, by not looking at that, you're leaving out a possible case of comparison, a compare and contrast, which could be quite interesting. The Renaissance in its, in its appropriation of ancient culture is not actually unique. It had been done before in a slightly different way and by people with a different social, different social setting and different philosophical values in some way. But it's an interesting opportunity for understanding that I think is missed. If I can have the next slide. Now, then one Arabic contribution that is always recognized is that of algebra. Um, the Greeks did not have algebra. It was invented by uh, a man called Al-Khwarizmi. Um, I won't try and give you the rest of his name. He's late 8th to early 9th century. And it is unrelated to anything Greek. The only thing, Greek thing it looks a bit like is the work of Diophantus of Alexandria, who deals with kind of equations with whole numbers in them. He's 3rd century AD. And although people have looked quite hard, there's no sign that, um, that, uh, Ibn, that uh, al khwarizmi knew anything about, about Diophantus. He seems to have invented, invented algebra because that kind of problem came up in Arabic life. For instance, there are inheritance problems about how much you have to leave to each of your relatives. Can I have the next slide, please? Now, while I talk about, talk about algebra, I thought I'd give you something to look at. You don't really want to look at equations, do you? And anyway, there aren't equations. Um, I happen to be in Venice. This is Piero della Francesca's St. Jerome um, in the Academia in Venice. And it, the picture's recently been cleaned. So I took a photograph of it. And I also took a close up, as you can see on the right, of Piero's signature. He carved his signature, as it were, into the, into the tree trunk, which is on the left of the picture and shown in my shown in my detail. You'll see why Piero is relevant in a minute. Now, al work was actually rather heavy going as well. It's quite, it's serious, heavy stuff. He actually proves that you can use algebra in the same way as you would use geometry. He gives geometrical results for geometrical proof for things like change side, change sign, all the rules we know in algebra. And the whole thing is thoroughly a thoroughly solid intellectual construction. After having done the intellectual construction and proved also that algebraic proof is really equivalent to geometrical proof, nobody doubted geometrical proof was all right because everyone had worked their way through Euclid. Um, Ibn al Haytham then gives a pile of examples. And these examples are what is picked up in the Western tradition, only the examples. A man called Leonardo of Pisa, sometimes known as Fibonacci, who lived from 1170 to 12, about 1240, picked up al khwarizmis work and wrote a book called Liber Abaci, Book of the Abacus, um, which is just problems from, uh, from al khwarizmi The problems are numerical and the numbers are written in Arabic script. What, you know, Arabic, what we would call Arabic numerals. Indeed, the earliest example we have of Arabic numerals in the West is a manuscript 
of a Latin translation of Alcuberis Mis, which was made, um, I think the translation is, is, is probably 12th century, but the, it's the very end of the 12th century, the translation, the, um, the, the manuscript is in New York, which has these earliest ever Arabic numerals in it. The, because things take their title from their first words, this translation of Alcuberismi was called Dixit Algorismus. And algorith Algorismus, which is a corruption of the name of Alcuberismi, has given us our word algorithm, which is absolutely fair because his book is absolutely full of them. What he does is he classifies equations saying, if you have an equation of the form, the squares are equal to the numbers, are equal to the thing, the squares of the things are equal to the things plus three plus the number. Then you do such and such and such and such and such and such. And then, God willing, you will get the answer such and such. He keeps putting in God willing in the middle of mathematics because he, he must have been rather pious. It's a bit disconcerting if you're following what you know to be a perfectly correct algorithm. Anyway, the Liber Abaci of Leonardo of Pisa became very popular because people were trying to learn elementary mathematics. This is to do partly with the spread of banking um, and also, other, also no doubt other things as well. It also had its usefulness in the marketplace. For instance, if you knew that a fish is, you're going to be charged so much per pound for the fish, but you're buying the whole fish. But when you actually come to use it, you're going to have to sell the head and the tail dirt cheap whereas only the middle bit can be charged for properly, you may need to do a few little calculations in your head as you bargain over the price. And the better you can bargain, the better, more likely you are to be making a comfortable profit on this thing. So a lot of towns, one way and another, found it useful to have, uh, give a mathematical education to their, to their citizenry. And so they would, they set up abacus schools in which books like that written by by Leonardo of Pisa, but in it, but in the vernacular. So although he wrote Liber Abaci in Latin, it is the characteristic of the abacus schools is that their work, their work is in, is in the vernacular. And using Arabic numerals, as I say, is the as is the way you recognize that you have an abacus text before you even start to read it. Now, Piero of Della Francesca's connection is seen in the next slide, please. Piero, as is recorded by Vasari, could have made his living as a mathematician. He was really rather good as a mathematician. And he actually wrote an abacus book, apparently not for use in a school, um, but at the request of friends. There is, in fact, tantalizingly no evidence for how or where Piero learnt his maths. He just obviously did. This is actually in his handwriting. He has nice legible handwriting. And you will notice that it's uh, educated humanistic cursive, that is. You don't learn that in the local school, I think. I suspect that his father, who was quite well off and was rather keen on so being socially mobile, upwards, of course, um, paid for Piero to have a private tutor. Anyway, it's, I'm not interested in the text at this point, but the drawing at the bottom, which shows you the characteristic triangle with sides 13, 14, and 15. I called this Piero's pet triangle when I first came across it. It turned out it was characteristic of all the abacus tradition. And later when I was reading Alcvarismi, I was flipping through looking to see if there were any geometrical problems because geometry was what interested me. Piero's abacus book is unusual in having quite a lot of geometry in it. Usually they have a lot of arithmetic, a little bit of algebra and even less geometry. Piero has a lot of arithmetic, but also almost equal amounts of, of algebra and geometry. It's a rather high powered algebra um, abacus book. Anyway, this triangle suddenly appeared was I was flipping through Alcvarismi. There it was with its, with its sides labeled in Arabic. The only Arabic I read is Arabic numerals, and there they were, Western Arabic numerals, modern printed Arabic. 
it took me a moment, I was so surprised, to shift my eyes right, shift my eyes left and read the French on the opposite page. That informed me that it was a surveying problem, find the area of a triangle. So the next time I came across Professor Rashed, he was the person responsible for the translation and as for the translations of Ibn al Haytham, I said, where did, do, you, do we know where al Khwarizmi got those triangles from? And he said, no, we don't, but they're in here on of Alexandria. Can we have the next slide, please? Now, this Hieron of Alexandria lives in the first century AD. We know because he because he observed an eclipse, which gives us, gives us a date, um, an eclipse of the sun, that is. Um, and this is from the modern Heiberg edition of Hieron of Alexandria. Now, whether, whether Al-Kharizmi had direct access to Hieron is not at all obvious. Though some of the other geometrical problems are a bit like Huron, this is not here the book for which Huron is very famous, the Pneumatica, which is about machines driven by either water or air, but a book called Geometry, which contains a lot of practical stuff useful for surveying, like finding the area of a triangle, um, which is where this one comes in, obviously. And he uses it again and again. If you want to know why it has such magic properties, why people keep using it, um, it's because the height above the side 14 is 12, as you may have been able to read on Piero, and that means that its height is going to be half the base times the height. The base is 14, half of that is 7 times 12 is 84. So you've got the triangle has got a, and everything is in whole numbers. And if you want to know how the neat whole numbers come about, I suggest you try cutting it apart along that vertical 12 and see what you get next. I, I leave that as an exercise to the readers. You would have been able to do it when you were 10, so be brave and have a go now. So we don't know, as I say, whether, whether um, al Khwarizmi knew Hiron of Alexandria, but it's quite clear that he had got access to, from, from other things, it's pretty clear he had got access to Greek learning. So in his way, he is a Renaissance figure, although uh, Arabic Renaissance, as it were, or Arabic naissance, since they don't start with it, it's not a recovery, it's a, it's a grab. Um, they, he would have, he would have known, he must have known about some Greek stuff as well. Now, if we can have the next slide, please. Algebra, Abacus books eventually get into print. And here we are getting back towards Leonardo because the first printed, printed algebra was that of Luca Pacioli, who was born about 1445, died about 1517. And it's called the Summa Dei Arismetica Verbal Verbal Verbal. It's printed in Venice. And as you can see, it's made to look expensive and as manuscript-like as possible. The content, the arithmetic, I don't know where it comes from. And I, I mean, it's, it's standard arithmetic stuff. It tells you how to add up fractions and that kind of thing. You can't really say where he took it from. Um, but the algebra problems are all out of, almost all, I think there's two that aren't, out of Piero della Francesca. Now this book is published in 1494. Piero della Francesca had died in 1492, and he he had died in San Sepolcro, which was also the town in which in which Luca Pacioli lived. Now Pacioli is not born till 1445, by which time Piero has left San Sepolcro, and it is most unlikely there was any personal connection between them. On the couple of occasions when Pacioli refers to Piero. What he, what he says is he calls him Nostro Conterraneo, our countrymen, which they were since they came from the same city. But he doesn't say he's my teacher or my friend or anything. Um, but printing Piero without using Piero's name was regarded as very cheeky by Vasari, who says that Pacioli stole the work. But on the other hand, Piero had stolen the problems too. They are entirely traditional things the solutions vary slightly, but the problems repeat again and again. And really, 
it's not it's you can't really call this call this plagiarism but it does mean that a lot of the problems are familiar but curiously although he is borrowing so heavily from uh, piero's from piero's uh, trattato d'abaco um pacioli does not have very much geometry and still less sort of optics his treatment of perspective is is really quite well, it, it's brief and pretty useless, actually. What he is good on is arithmetic. If we could look at, have the next slide, please. Um, the next slide shows a multiplication table. Um, he has actually, actually um, written out multiplication in full several times pages and pages it all looks rather odd because this is algebra with no symbolism he so he the when he means times he writes plus but he writes it as a p with a line through it it's got an abbreviation and that will eventually become a plus sign but he has no inkling of a beginnings of a of an equal sign so you have these pages covered in numbers and symbols and they look a bit odd the multiplication table looks much more familiar and the interesting thing about this particular multiplication table, and one member of the audience at least is well ahead of me here, because I nicked it from her book, is that it was copied by Leonardo da Vinci. Now, this sheet is dated to 1494, probably on the basis of this, this piece of pinching from Pacioli, but you need to reflect a little on the fact that Leonardo wanted to write out a multiplication table he was in his 40s by, by now, wasn't he? Well, yes, yes, he must have been 50, 52 to, to 94. He was in his 40s. Now, this is the multiplication table that was put up on the, on the wall in my junior school, and you had to get up and walk over to look at it. Hang on, have you, have you lost the slide? It's the one after that. That one, yes. Um, this was the multiplication table that was put up on the wall in my junior school and you had to get up and look at it. And most of us had sort of got it by heart after a bit because getting up and looking at it was a fairly, you know, made, made you conspicuous. You won the, were the one that didn't know your multiplication tables. Now it suggests, this suggests to me that Leonardo was not very interested in arithmetic. He managed to get away without doing it, um, probably by charm or something, the kind of person one hopes and doesn't have to try and teach maths to. However, when it comes to geometry, if we can have the next page, please. Uh, uh, this time, this time Pacioli is borrowing from Piero, not only from the Trattato d'Abaco, which contains some mathematics, some, some, uh, some, some geometry, but also from a book on a book on the five regular solids and this is one of them this is the dodecahedron drawn by leonardo from models and on the right you can see a little sketch by leonardo showing what you might get if you cut the corners off neatly so that each of the cuts gives you an equilateral triangle where before you had a corner of the solid and you can if you look at the next next slide please you can see what happens if you do try this with a more complicated solid and there the drawing on the left shows you the Leonardo's drawings as they were in the printed book. The drawings were Leonardo's drawings were made apparently as a substitute for actual models. Um, the manuscript was given to the Duke uh, with, with, uh, with, with drawings rather than with a load of cardboard presumably for ease of storage in the library. Now, if we can have the next slide, please, you can see the decidedly non-perspectival way that book illustrations were normally done, certainly in maths books at this time. Um, there's a hodgepodge of different styles. I won't try to explain them for, to you. They leave wide margins for you to draw your own, but in this case, they've actually been printed in for you. This is again the summer. You can see it's, it's another edition with them. Um, it's got Gothic, Gothic print. Oh, I may say another thing that makes it particularly difficult to read 
is that spelling, as I'm sure you know, was phonetic at the time. And this book is being thought in Tuscan and spelt accordingly. And it is then typeset by Venetians. And oh boy, the combination is, is, is quite interesting sometimes. Now, if we have the next slide, please. Leonardo did, of course, do drawings, serious drawings, as part of his work of a paint, as a painter. And indeed, his drawings of the models of the polyhedra probably started off as just part of his job as a painter. Paint me those things. And so he did some drawings of them. Um, painters have made very careful observations of things. Um, sometimes, sometimes Leonardo is drawing things that are going to be incorporated into, into a particular painting. Sometimes they seem to be just studies of something he'd seen. This is a star, a thing called the Star of Bethlehem. I was going to give you a photograph of the real thing, only thanks to COVID, I couldn't get into Kew Gardens at the time that the things are in flower and they don't put them out in the Alpine house except when they're in flower. This plant apparently grows rather high up on mountains and, and likes a well-drained well -drained gravelly, uh, gravelly soil. So Leonardo may have, may have found this on a hilltop or something. But the careful observation that, that painters put into studying things for, for incorporation in paintings, presumably because their, their patrons expected the flowers to be done reasonably accurately, or at least expected their hawks and their, and their, and their horses to be done reasonably accurately, does sort of pay off in the longer run in book illustration um, and also in, in the study of botany and whatnot. So again, you are looking at the art side of what was to become a contribution, a contribution to science. When you come to the other conventional use of mathematics in painting, next slide, please. Um, namely Leonardo's Last Supper, which was painted between 1495 and 98, according to what I've been told in Santa Maria delle Grazie, in, you, oh, back, yeah, that's it, in the refectory in Santa Maria delle Grazie in, in Milan, you can see partly why people kind of give up on perspective. The constructions that you're given all assume that you're, you can get your eye height to, to agree with that of something in the picture, somebody sitting or standing in the picture so you can identify with them and see what they would be seeing as it were. Now, almost all frescoes are painted well above eye height. What you see at the bottom, as I'm sure most of you know, is a doorway, the top of a doorway. This picture is well, well above eyesight, eye height. And if it, you'd taken it as if it was a photograph snapshot as seen from below, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be seeing the top of the table. You probably wouldn't be seeing Christ's face too well either. So Leonardo has done it sort of more or less straight on. This is the usual compromise that painters make when doing scenes in perspective when they're painted on a wall. Um, and of course, you've got, we've no way of knowing what angles you are going to be looking at pictures from unless they happen to be fixed ones like this on a wall. The perspective construction can be sort of more or less followed as more or less correct, assuming your eye height is about the same as the eye height of Christ, which is, as I said, physically unreasonable. The bit where it all breaks down is when you start looking at these possibly tapestries hanging on the wall behind, where Leonardo seems to be much more concerned with the pattern they made on the wall than with um, any kind of mathematical perspective. Now that does not imply incompetence on his part, it is simply what everybody does and good luck to them. It is the only sensible way of dealing with what was an intractable problem. So maybe I have the next slide, please. Now let's get to something that was more directly technological and was actually connected with the revival of antiquity, which is what people tend to think of the Renaissance for, indeed what they named it for. This is a statue of the Emperor Marcus Aurelius, 
riding on what I think is a rather small horse um, on the Capitoline in Rome. Uh, it dates from probably the one about 170 something AD uh, because he just had some victories. It, it seems to have been gilded. I'm not sure how much of it was gilded. Anyway, it's been given a perfectly splendid theatrical, theatrical setting because uh, whereas most architects got roped in to do stage sets, Michelangelo, it is he, was allowed to have a go at, re at manipulating central Rome. He did a very good job on it. I'm not suggesting he shouldn't have got the job, but it just shows what kind of a life you can live if you're really good at things. Anyway, um, this horse was an obvious target, as it were. Can you do a life-size horseman? Because we're trying to revive ancient, next slide please, ancient crafts. And the answer is yes, we can. This is Donatello having a go at a full-size horseman, the first time since antiquity. Now, Donatello tends to sign things Donatelli Opus, so I make no, no, no apology for calling him by his nickname, but he's actually Donato dei Bardi. The Bardi are um, a banking fam big banking family. They looked after him, he was a poor cousin, uh, but it's possible they gave him a good mathematical education. He does seem to understand, we've talked about the laws of optics, he does seem to understand the laws of perspective, the rules of perspective and quite a lot of other comp quite complicated mathematics. He just chooses to ignore them. Anyway, when it comes to casting bronze, as I, as I mentioned earlier, you do have to do a bit of maths about the weight and what, what you can get away with and things. And one of the things Donatello thought he couldn't get away with was having the horse's foot off the ground. And you can see what he's done is put a ball under the hoof of the, the front hoof. So the hoof is raised and because there's a ball under it, a sort of one of those caltrop things designed to stop the horses from moving through, through somewhere. If you threw a load of, a load of steel, of um, bronze or steel obstacles to, to the horse, you know, it would, it would make, make it difficult for a cavalry charge, for instance. Um, the, he's made the thing look unstable by putting the, the horse's foot on a ball. It has got military connections. I mean, it's not an impossible, it's not a piece of pure geometry, but he's managed to destabilize the look of the horse. On the other hand, the rider looks perfectly self-confident and he doesn't look in the least bit unstable. He also looks smaller compared with the size of the horse than the Emperor Marcus Aurelius does, which may of course just be telling you something about the kind of horse. The sitter, by the way, is, is, is as it were, literally, is Gatamlata, who was a well-known, uh, a well-known, not very, not very trustworthy, um, not very, not very trustworthy condottiere, a professional, professional mercenary soldier. Gatamlata means honey cat. He was nice to you, but he couldn't be trusted. And the next statue in this parade of horses, next photograph, um, is one Leonardo most certainly knew because it's by Verrocchio. This is the statue of Bartolomeo Colleoni, another, another condottiere in Venice. Um, he got the statue put up by leaving the Venetian Republic an awful lot of money on condition they put up a statue to him. He did say he wanted the statue outside St. Mark's um, meaning he wanted it in St. Mark's Square. The Venetians weren't having that, so they decided to put it near St. Mark's Hospital instead. So he's beside the church of San Giovanni e Paolo. And I may say that in a kind of revenge, which may not be deliberate, the little, the little street that leads you up to a straight view of this horse, perpendicular to the horse, as it were, is called Calle del Cavallo. It's the horse they're naming rather than but Bartolomeo Colleone, he would be very annoyed. As you can see, he looks as though being annoyed was his forte anyway. And this horse has got its foot off the ground. This is a, uh, this was done right at the end of Verrocchio's life and Leonardo must have known quite a lot about it. Um, now, casting a large bronze, we've already seen that Verrocchio was told to do was told to do the ball on the top of the cathedral because it was a big piece of bronze casting. And for that, you needed to be professional. 
But of course, the other thing you needed to be professional to, go, to cast in large bronzes were cannon. Now, the first people to write about cannon, um, uh, the things about warfare, um, cannon don't really become useful as weapons rather than just as a threat until the beginning of the 16th century. Um, but Leonardo, we know, knew a book about, about military engineering by one of the precursors in this genre, um, Roberto Valturio, um, who's 1405 to 75, De Re Militari. We know that, or at least we nearly know it, I suppose, because Cosimo de Medici owned a copy and Leonardo almost certainly would have, would have known the thing. But by the time, by the middle of the next century, people are writing about bronze casting in general, but with an eye to canon. And the standard book is by a man called Vanoccio Biringuccio. Um, it's called, uh, let me, ooh, Della Pyrotechnia. I thought when I first saw that title, gosh, it's going to be about fireworks, pyrotechnics, no such luck. It's about use of fire in engineering work, and it's all about cannon and how to how to how to cast your cannon, how to bore the cannon so that they're nice and smooth inside. Now, the thing about cannon, if you want to study cannon, is that you could only use them for a certain length of time until the metal got, as it were, tired, and you recast them or else they were likely to burst. So cannon tend to have their date written on them, and you're advised, you know, use, use, there's a use by date implied by the date of manufacture written on them. So cannon were tended to be melted, re, re, and, and the metal reused, of course, because it was expensive. So there is no way that you are going to learn about how they worked bronze by looking at cannon, on the other hand, the you do they don't they haven't tried to remelt uh, Bartolomeo Colleoni yet. Probably there was a clause in his will that said if they ever melted the melted the statue, they had to give back the money. And you know the Venetians, they wouldn't ever do that. Like I wouldn't ever give back the money, as it were. Now it's interesting that Venice is actually importing a Florentine to do the work. That's quite surprising in its way. Um, they people there tends to be a little a certain amount of local patriotism. On the other hand, this kind of this kind of mastery of dealing with metal um, certainly seems to have appealed to people and to have been recognised as being a kind of mastery which had its uses in other walks of life. It's a, it's a sort of impressive technology, and there must be a rationale behind it, but what? And it is no accident, I think, that Galileo Galilei is born 1564, dies 1642, so he's a lot later than this statue. He, he says that he learned an awful lot of, of stuff that later, later comes out in his books about science by looking at the work of the, of the uh, people making ships in the Arsenale in Venice. Uh, now, can I have the next photograph? Next slide, thank you. Now, most of Venice, as I'm sure you know, looks as though it's posing for a photograph. This is not true of the Arsenale. It was a ship workshop. It was a military restricted zone until fairly recently. Now they hold the Biennale partly in it, so one gets to walk through it. Um, attempts to take a photograph of the entrance gate from the from the city side convinced me I should have been doing it by from a boat, of course, because this whacking great bridge in the way. However, you can go over the bridge if you can see the next slide, please. Um, I walked over the bridge and took a photograph as I went, and you can you may notice that in this. In the beautiful light they have in Venice, sometimes the shadows look at least as solid as the buildings. I was heading for the top left hand corner, there's a coffee shop there. Um, there's a coffee shop all over the place, but that's a reasonably good one. Anyway, the big war memorial you can see on the wall of the Arsenale, the main wall, is to the dead of, of the Battle of Lepanto, 
which was fought in 1571 against the Turks. The Venetians reckon they won it. Um, they certainly cut down a lot of trees in what is now Yugoslavia. Um, oh, sorry, what was, was until recently Yugoslavia, I should say. It was Croatia and it all, almost all of it belonged to the Venetians at the time. Um, anyway, uh, that, that war memorial is interesting because it's an example of classical revival architecture, but I don't think we want to go into that. The rest of it, the rest of the building, as you can see, is rather plain, really. Um, it sort of looks as if it's medieval tidied up a bit. Once you go inside, you get um, a, more, um, a more Renaissance look, if I can have the next slide, please. Um, the architect of this little lot is Jacopo Sansovino, uh, 1486 to 1570. It was built in the 1550s. Um, and well, I think, I think it was finished just in the early 60s. Anyway, this is a dock and you can see on the left, um, you can see some of the main buildings. They're rather difficult to photograph because really what you're seeing is a sort of cityscape of this pinkish brick with gray Istrian marble surrounds. It's very elegantly proportioned um, but it doesn't lend itself to sort of photography. And also, of course, this being Venice, taking a step back to improve your view is likely to end up with you falling in the water. So you have to be a bit careful. Anyway, this is the dock and you can see the scale of it from the, from the little people that are visible. Um, there's a rather better photograph of it in the next slide, please, um, which shows you what it looks like if you're about to sail out into the sea. You turn left to go to the city, to the gate I showed you coming in, and you turn right to go to the sea where a similar gate takes you out into the lagoon. Uh, I should have pointed out that the gate of the Arsenale doesn't look as if you could possibly defend it. It doesn't look as if it's intended to withstand a siege of any kind. And there is of course a reason for that. No enemy ever got that far. Venice relied on its ships. There was an idea to fortify Venice put city walls around it, but they never quite got off the ground. They lost a land battle in 1509, but they arranged never to fight another one. That was a much better solution in some ways. Now, Galileo says he learned a lot from the people in the Arsenale, but he doesn't tell you exactly what. The book in which this remark occurs is about the strength of materials, and he had probably looked at the way that wood was put together to make boats, obviously, to make ships. Um, but in any case, it is quite clear that here you have someone who is a fully paid up intellectual. Um, he's being paid to write books that make his patrons famous. Uh, he writes usually in some of it in Latin, but then he gets in later life, he gets into writing things in Italian um, because there's a big enough there's a big enough readership for them and he doesn't in any case wish to be identified with the professors um, because he's he's going out in this practical way doing a lot of experimentation and that again is something that is connected with the technological tradition you try it and you see if it works that is very much the way that an engineer works rather than the way that a high-powered intellectual physicist works trying to work out how the world works, how the world manages things without, without um, actually trying any experiments at this period. Galileo, Galileo's great contribution to the development of natural philosophy was to, to make experimental method, the try it and see if it works. And if it doesn't try again, try something different until you get an insight into the processes by simply trying to do things again and again different ways. Um, that is Galileo's great contribution. It's possibly partly influenced by the fact that Galileo's father was a practical craftsman, again of a rather intellectual kind, um, Vincenzo Galilei. He was a distinguished music theorist and, and played the lute. Um, he wrote a book on how to tune the lute um, and also a book on a book on ancient music. Uh, so Galileo may have learned something about sort of tuning practice and musicianship from his father. Now these days, of course, we take it for granted that, that 
that even even artists learn a lot of mathematics or a lot of a lot of actual science if we can have the next slide please this is part of my ulterior motive for being inside the inside the arsenale this is from last year's from last year's biennale um, outside th this this was inside a building but the outside of the structure showed an octagon made of mirrors it appeared to be pretty good when i went inside i was expecting repeated reflections in the two pairs of in the four pairs of parallel of parallel sides as you would you can see how you get in through these flaps which are visible in my photograph on the right but when i got in i discovered that i wasn't really visible um, from certain angles i could see myself but from others i became a ghost so i seized the opportunity not given to many people to photograph my own ghost it probably had a serious a serious meaning this was the chilean pavilion and i think it was probably about how being locked away from the world turns you into an almost nothingness a feeling that some of us have been getting a bit of firsthand recently anyway the point is that it requires a great deal of mathematical precision uh, and these these days artists are probably still very good technicians some of them but we're not looking at them in quite the same way and because we are, because everybody is taught the science that goes behind it there's nothing very exotic about reflection and if we can have the last slide that again shows you a piece of of wizardry um, which would have been very very difficult to make without precision cutting materials and god knows what else this is the um this is from the exhibition of the work of Olafur Eliasson uh in the in the Tate uh last again late last year it seems longer ago than that the thing was actually rotating and you could see the symmetry and the reflections I thought it was rather Leonardesque this sort of floating polyhedron and probably a good note to end on I'm sorry if I've gone on gone on too long um I'm afraid the the late start rather mithered me anyway if you have any questions I'd be happy to try and answer them Thank you very much, Judith, for a lovely talk. I'm sorry I um, lost, lost the PowerPoint at one or two points. Um, I'm used to a different system which doesn't behave the same way. Um, so thank you for that talk. Um, it was fascinating and um, I'm sure we have questions. Um, so um, if you have questions, please put them in the chat. And um so are, are there any questions oh. uh, I'm going... is there a chat in fact oh. Have I silenced everybody? I'm sorry. I I I didn't feel I was very coherent. I'm I'm afraid I was rather out of breath before I started. No, I don't think you silenced people. I think that they are silenced by Zoom at the moment, and um, I can't see a chat window. No. Which may be because I'm stupid. You're my computer whiz, so I'm relying on you to. Oh, I'm sh I'm sharing screen. That's why. So oh, of course, perhaps. yes. Sorry, I'm not used to Zoom as it happens. Um, well, I've got I've got a whacking great white notice right across the front of across the middle of, of the screen as I see your Zoom. Right. Do you want me to investigate that phenomenon? Um, no, um, I think okay. Um, so, if, does if, does anyone have any questions? I'll either put them in the chat window, or if we do hand up, we can ask you to talk.
Hmm. We have one question that says, um, where will this be published? Oh, um, well, there's no, I've got no intention of publishing. We were, we have recorded the talk, but I'm afraid I would rather redo the talk to be recorded in a more coherent way. Um, because as I say, I was rather put off things, but if, if all goes well and we can come to some kind of an agreement and if my colleagues think it's worth publishing, then it might be. I, some of what I said was part of a talk I gave in Turin, but I don't think that's being published either. Um, some of it, some of it has, has come out, but it's putting it together that um, the sort of main, main story is what I haven't ever really done. It's book length, I'm afraid. I should have said a question again by saying magnificent lecture. Thank you so very much. That's very polite. Who was that? <laughs> Are there any more questions or comments? Tony, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, Francis has just put a question. Oh. Has it got through to you? No, that's Christopher. No, okay. Hello. <laughs> Hello, Joe, Judith. Well, Francis, why not say it? Well, I, would, I was especially interested in the, the gnomon in Florence Cathedral. Yes. That was a really interesting um, insight on the development and the skills in astronomy uh, at that time. And? And do we have any evidence of um, Leonardo uh, using that idea at all? Um, well, there's a complicate. There is a complication because sometimes they try to use a similar camera obscura sort of setup to find the size of the sun, the size of the disk of the sun, because mm. of course you can't look at the damn thing directly. It's far too bright. Um, and that lands them in all sorts of little problems. Um, and it turns out that you have to think about the size of the hole in the camera obscura in order to use the thing to calculate the size of the sun. Now that seems very obvious once you've stated it. It took Johannes Kepler to prove it. That's mm -hmm. in his 1604 book again. Um, but astronomers regularly used a camera obscura and also a gnomon to indicate noon was fairly common in town halls and anything else that was big enough to take the pick to take it um, right. as a way for noon you know you then fired a cannon and everyone adjusted their clocks kind of thing except mm -hmm. they don't have clocks that is exactly the problem <laughs> right. thank you yep. thank you we have a couple more comments um book then ex excellent is a comment um it doesn't work for a publisher does it <laughs> yes um, that was a wonderful lecturer. I've learned so much. Thank you. Also love your humour. And a question from Matthew Landris. What percentage of Leonardo's studies do you consider to be copies of contemporary sources? I've never given the matter any consideration at all. I think you should ask an expert. <laughs> Sorry, yes, I know that's a difficult question. I, I just thought, I was just trying to think about just general questions. And it's something I bring up every now and then as a, as a problem. But that's a magnificent lecture. I really, I really uh, hope you do publish it. I, it. It really is very important contribution as well to uh, what, we, what we know about uh, his resources, his potential mm -hmm. resources as well. So thank you very much. Judith, how far do you think he ever talked about these issues with other people? I mean, do we... Can we have any idea? Well, who you mean, Leonardo? Yes. Well, I mean, no. we've got all his 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 notebooks and everything. It's I'm interested in this business of how much social exchange he had. Well, we do know we do have things in his notebooks which are sort of little scrappy remarks, which are probably he'd asked someone about something and they told him and he'd written down the answer, kind of thing. 
because he moved in a court, so he would have met all sorts of people. And if he'd wanted to know details about, say, cannon and cannon boring, I'm sure he could have found an expert. Yeah. Though if you ask too many questions about armaments, I think you get locked up. <laughs> but Leonardo was being paid as a military engineer, so perhaps he wouldn't have been. Because there's the, the, the sense I have uh, as far as uh, the man is concerned is that he was a fairly slippery individual, wasn't he? I mean, he, he moved away out of situations when he wanted to go to pastures new. And therefore, I've often wondered if he was in some ways rather solitary. I don't think he could have been allowed to be solitary if he was living in a court. Uh -huh. And if your job is to design the costumes for next week's festivities, I think you have to talk to the actors and, 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 and also the patron. Yes, thank you. So, um, I mean, you, you might prefer solitude sometimes. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Some artists manage to be quite, quite, quite solitary. I mean, like Michelangelo was sort of well known to tell you to go, go away, even if you were the Pope. But mm. he got away with all sorts, as I, as I mentioned in, in the matter of being allowed to remodel central Rome. Yeah. yeah. We have uh, some more comments. Thank you for an excellent lecture. Um, a comment regarding God willing. Muslim scholars often put in the name of God, etc., at the head of every page of the work in our time as well. No, not at the page. Um, not, well, not in manuscripts, it usually occurs right at the beginning. So you get in the name of God, the compassionate, the merciful, let there be a triangle ABC with a right angle at B. <laughs> you get used to it after a bit. <laughs> I know it does sound funny, doesn't it? Yes. I mean, the comment is a great lecture. Another comment. Thank you. Question. Thank you for a wonderful lecture. Is there evidence that Leonardo was aware of the calendar problem, i.e., the calendar being out of step with the position of the sun? Um, I don't know. Usually, you can tell whether people were considered to be competent at mathematics, as astronomy was part of it um, at the time. This is academic mathematics. Um, by whether they were asked about the calendar. I mean, when Copernicus, as a young man, visited Italy, he was promptly asked about calendar reform, gave an opinion which was duly ignored. Um, uh, he, was, he was wrong anyway, looking back on it. Um, but he, he probably knew there was a, a sort of known problem. Um, he might have understood what they were trying to do, but the problem of the irregularity of the motion of the sun along the ecliptic is it's quite complicated um i mean it, it i don't he, he doesn't show any real interest in in mathematical astronomy um he does he does of course there's that beautiful little picture of the old moon in the new moon's arms i mean he did obviously look at the sky and he probably thought it was beautiful but there's no reason to suppose that he was interested in astronomy, which very rapidly becomes mathematical in this period. We don't have any more questions unless I've missed some. Um... I have a potential question. I don't know how to type it out. Okay, about the canon, you can, you can if I might. Yeah. I, can, I can hear you. Okay. Uh, about canon, uh, as, you, as you've seen, I'm sure, uh, Leonardo had proposed canon uh, designs with... Uh, with um, Multiple uh, barrels. Multiple barrels, yes, indeed. And, and larger canon that had stone in them, or um, um, I don't know about concrete necessarily, but he mentions, you know, filler, lots of impressive uh, ideas. Well, I, a concrete wouldn't have been worth the trouble. They were right, still right. And so I do. They were right. Still so I wonder what you think of that. Did, was he trying to think of innovative ways of making canon in a cheaper way that still would keep them, uh, you know, solid enough for use? And that's um, one thing I wonder when I see the filler. He, he might have, he might have been because, um, I mean, the problem was there were sort of problems of the things recoiling and whatnot, but there was an ongoing problem of the damn things exploding. 
Um, the reason that King, I think it's King James V comes to the throne, King James V of Scotland, that is, comes to the throne at such a young age is because his father had just been killed by a gun being fired in his honour. Um, I mean, it was not, un not unknown if you put a little too much, too much um, gunpowder in, they just, the, the cannon went, you know. Um, but Leonardo, I mean, his multiple, his gun with multiple barrels is pretty impractical mechanically, but also because getting the barrel right was the most difficult bit of it, getting it properly smooth inside. So he may have, he could have talked to gunners, but in his period, um, cannon tend to be sort of rather short and fat um, and, and not, not really realistic weapons. I mean, a ballista was a much more dangerous siege, siege thing than um, in that, that catapult that you worked on is a much more realistic kind of thing than a cannon because there's trouble with the chemical composition of gunpowder as well. Mm. That's another, another thing. You don't know that your chemicals aren't what you thought they were until there's trouble. And with a cannon, the trouble can be mortal. Right, so, so that does help a lot with our understanding of why the Farrarese were so much more trusted with the cannon making in, in, uh, in the area of, of um, North of, of North Italy and Central Italy to some extent. I mean, they, people would just go to the Ferraris for advice. Uh, it seemed to be such a specialism. Yes, I can see that. It, yes, it could well have been. I mean, Bidding Good Show's book is fifteen forty, and it's 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 not. I mean, obviously, is not telling you everything. He came from Siena. Um, I mean, they probably have exiled him for good or chopped his head off if he told the whole truth and nothing but the truth, kind of thing. It, I mean, we've, you've got to realize people lie about this. And tradesmen, in fact, lie about their crafts to, um, to Diderot in the 18th century. So you, and, and it's most unlikely a military engineer would be writing down everything he knew in the 16th. They didn't even Not a question. try you before they put you in jail in those days. Thank you. Another question, thank you so much. Are there any more multiplication charts drawn by Leonardo? Um, you have to ask Giuliana Barone that because it's her book I nicked it from. But I still think a man who in his 40s needs one of those is not, not going to be hired for his ability with arithmetic. Yeah, well, there are several and uh, Martin knows uh, a lot about it. Um, and not only in the Codex Arundel, which was the image that Judith showed us. Also in the Codex Foster, we see uh, Leonardo studying Pacioli, Suma, and so on. But yeah, it was a very good example, Judith. Thank you. I was interested that it was the, the numbers were in his right hand, not his left. Why should that have been? Ooh, I don't know. Again, yeah, well, in that particular example, he was not interested only in copying the actual numbers, but in also writing the names given to the multiplication. So maybe it was just, you know, he was reading um, Piero and he, I don't know, he wanted to memorize it. And maybe it was for, I don't know. <laughs> he actually has several, um, several versions, let's say, of that table. Mm -hmm. Does he ever, does he ever write numerals back to front? Yes, he does. He does. Yeah, yeah. Even because, when he numbers the pages. Because when Arabic numerals yeah. first appeared in the West, they were sometimes written back to front. Mm. So that 49 would be written 9-4. Mm, mm, yeah. The actual numerals weren't reversed, but... but. Yeah. And, because and for his wa water fountain, fountain, there was... Oh, sorry. There, was, uh, there are uh, number tables for the water fountain uh, study. There's another comment from um, Dr. C.M. Pyle. Uh, thank you also for referring to Tom Settle's work and thought, linking the technological and craftsmanship, so think, linking the technological and craftsmanship to the scientific and artistic. Oh, good. I think you have a number of buyers for your book when it comes out here. Well, um, 
if I give them a list of publishers to pass them on to. <laughs> So I think we may not have any more questions, in which case, um, thank you again, Judith, for a wonderful lecture, which has been very enthusiastically received. And thank you everybody for coming. And um, hope to see you at our next event. And um, have a good evening or afternoon or morning or whatever it is, wherever you are, because I know we have people from all around the world here. So thank you everybody. Thank you, Julie. Thank, you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Glad it was all right. There were some nice pictures anyway. If you're going to talk about art, you get some nice pictures. And we'd rather have seen you, Judy. Can I? Um, Tony, can I? Can